Uh, stand for the pledge. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Don't see anyone in the audience to ask any questions. So moving on, review policy regulations for a possible first reading. Thank you, Mr. Recky. Uh, the first item we have is under instruction. It's a proposed new policy uh, grounded in conversations we had a couple of months back with fencing. The uh, There were a number of students, parents, advocates who came uh, expressing an interest in initiating a fencing at the varsity level at Cheshire High. That there's been a club that's existed for many years, <clears throat> and as we, you know, started to look at it, at least certainly in Cheshire, but then on a much broader scale, nobody really had a plan for what to do uh, to transition from a club to a varsity sport. Is such a I uh, worked with Mr. Parasino, our athletic director, Dr. Gad, Mr. Massiana, and others to draft a proposal uh, for your review here this evening. Uh, and I'll just throw it up on the screen. In essence, it, it, I don't know if you'd prefer I read it to you or you don't have it. Cheshire believes in the value of interscholastic athletic competition as such. It is important that we provide a robust program that is diverse in interest season and ensures equitable opportunities for participation. The criteria below should be considered as sports seek to be considered for varsity interscholastic competition. Teams interested in pursuing varsity status should have a documented history of sustained participation as a club for at least three years. Be prepared to commit to a varsity schedule five to six days per week if that is not already in place. Commit to following all expectations of other athletic programs at Cheshire High School, such as activity fees, participation in one sport per season, and only one sport per season, see rule, etc. Further details can be found in the Cheshire High School Athletic Student uh, Athletics Handbook. Have coaches certified by uh, the state of Connecticut participate in one of three CIC designated sports seasons, fall, winter, or spring. Present a fully inclusive operating budget for review by the superintendent of schools. And then if the sport is adopted, operate within a budget approved, which may be different than the submitted budget by the Board of Education as managed by the superintendent of schools. Uh, not disrupt the Title IX participation ratios to ensure equal opportunities for all students. Identify a proposed location for competition practices and equipment storage. This may be done with the support of Cheshire School Administration. Be identified by the Connecticut Interscholastic Athletic Conference as a CIAC sport. Alternatively, they may be identified by another statewide or national organization with full governing authority. Um, and then I just identify what the CIAC controlled are by season for boys and girls. Full adoption of a sport would be contingent upon the completion of a three-year probationary period, at which time the program will be reviewed by the high school administration and central office administration and presented to the Board of Education. Um, with this policy, a few highlights I'd like to just touch upon. I think what we tried to do was identify uh, items that made sense. Um, and I only mean that in a logical way and not necessarily a financial way, but the financial considerations are certainly woven in here. Um, with respect to the identified by CIAC or other governing body, there has to be a set of rules that you're competing against other people with. And um, if CIAC is not fully overseeing that, then somebody else needs to be. Um, in the sport of fencing, there is a, a regional governing authority that, that does that. Uh, wanted to be clear about the 
one sport per season because right now if you're in the fencing club you could also participate in another varsity sport uh, if you choose um, wanted to be clear about the c rule and i've shared these things i mean this this isn't the fencing rule but because fencing kind of initiated this um, draft i would share it with them and you know they've kind of signed on and I feel like these things make sense to them too Patient for competition practices and equipment storage. This may be done with the support of Cheshire High School Administration. I think I'd want to change that to Cheshire Public Schools Administration because, for instance, in the sit in the, in spent in the, the there really is not you know we don't have gym space at Cheshire High to be able to accommodate them. Uh, there's tremendous demand already in place between the existing sports teams and um, we are the community facility in, the, in Cheshire. I can hear kids next door in the Dodge gym now, which is great. Um, and I, I don't want to tell all the youth programs or other sports that now you're being bumped by this other sport. We want to find a way to accommodate them. So, if, you know, uh, all of a sudden, let's just say the, the uh, pickleball club said, we need to, we're going to start a sort of our city program and we need to have access to the football field every afternoon for the fall. Well, I've already got hundreds of kids on there playing football and soccer. We're going to have to find a different location if you want to indeed become a sport. Um, and the same thing is the case for fencing. Um, and, you know, thankfully, we do have other gyms in town and, and they may not be as accommodating today as they will be uh, after 2026 when new buildings open, but those are options. Um, and, uh, you know, that work for that group. Uh, right now they're in the, in the, um, the commons area, they call the Cheshire High School, and that's worked for the last you know, 10 years or so. So um, I don't know, maybe they'd prefer to stay there, but I think it, I don't want to just limit it to Cheshire High School administration. Um, I think it would be, make sense to say Cheshire Public Schools administration will probably be Cheshire High School first. Go ahead. Sure. So this um, policy existed until you drafted. Yeah. Correct. This. So it still doesn't exist until we give it three readings. But the points that you make do apply to all the sports that are in yeah there's nothing sports right now. yeah so uh it's a good question i think the genesis of this was what do we expect of current city athletic programs in a lot of ways this outlines that um and uh, i think served as the foundation for the for the proposal great <clears throat> do we have any other clubs that are existing for three years at this point? Uh, we have a lot of clubs that have existed for more than three years. I, I don't know of any that um, would be on the precipice of a varsity program. Other, I mean, like fencing is a fringe, I would guess we'd call it fringe varsity sport through CIAC. Yeah. It's not a CIAC sanctioned sport. Uh, robotics is a, in a similar position, I would say. Um, the although we don't have a, a robust team at Cheshire High School today, uh, the other one is um, the electronic gaming has kind of come onto the scene and emerged as a, a program, a viable program for some schools. So those are the only two that I as I sit here today, at one point, uh, rugby had made a push yeah. to try and become a varsity sport, and that wasn't sustained. I have a question, Mr. Chair. Um, over the, when Title IX came in, did we, did, did we drop any varsity sports, and did we move anything around to no. So basically, you have to be relatively commensurate 
in terms of the numbers of participants with the enrollment. Um, and years ago, I did a full spreadsheet and I sustained that spreadsheet over the years just to kind of, you know, be aware of where we are. Um, at that point that it was initially created, we had more female sport participants than we had male. Uh, it was disproportionate in that respect. Um, it's not, do you have more boys or girls playing sports, but you can't have like 60% male population in the school, 40% female and have 60% female sports population and only 40% male. That's where people would start to say, Hey, is there a problem here? So our numbers in terms of the ratio of males to females in the school and males to females participating in athletics or commensurate. Not identical. I mean, it vacillates over years, but it's, it's commensurate. What year did Title IX come into play? Oh, I, I'll, I'll you have to pass on that one. I'll Sorry. take, uh, I'll take, I'll take federal guidelines for a thousand. Yeah. 72 <laughs> was, 72 was, uh, ADA. That was, yeah. The, I, th I think it was later. Than 72. I think it was later than 72 also, but I don't okay. know. This is my about final that jeopardy. Sorry for that question. That's okay. <laughs> Adam. Um, so there's language in here about documented history of sustained participation, but then also about a three-year probation. So which takes precedence? And in this case, since... Uh, the uh, club that came in here documenting, I guess, 20 years of history. Uh, if this policy were to be um, approved, does that mean that we grandfather them in and they are instantly varsity sport? Or um, would they then have to enter into a probation period of three years under these new guidelines, which they hadn't had before? So the, the way that I think we envisioned it um, and, and maybe I need to be clear on that, that the criteria here are for, for the school system and ultimately, you know, the board would fund, um, you know, I'm sure the superintendent would recommend if these criteria are met. Once these criteria are met and we go to funding the program, they are on a probationary varsity period for three years. Two years into that, or the third year into that probationary period, you've got four kids that show up every week. We can't, we can't sustain this. And we would have to make a decision at the conclusion of the third year as to whether or not this is a permanent varsity program off of probation. So they would move to a varsity status, but under a probationary, um, you know, uh, umbrella, if you will, for the three year period. Does that make sense? Is that clear? Yes. Um, I guess um, then I'm also thinking about, so if um, this club becomes a varsity sport or probationary varsity sport, does that mean there's opportunity at, let's say the middle school or, or, uh, or is that point, um, everything just it remains a club until you get to the high school, you know, whatever sure. apparatus they have. Good question. You know. the, the, um, there are numerous sports that exist at the varsity level that do not exist at the middle school level. That is a completely different animal. Um, and, you, you know, I guess at the middle school, um, you know, people could – ask for consideration to add as a sport. This is an a varsity level sport. And, and frankly, you don't see as much of that because there's so much youth league uh, opportunity at the middle school level, which diminishes to a degree at the high school level. I have a question about membership because it looked to me like the fencing team had a wide variety of age levels, including maybe middle school students, and certainly there were adults also as part of that group. Um, what happens 
when it becomes a varsity sport, I assume you have to be a CHS student. Yeah, that, that would be a criteria as outlined in our athletics handbook. Right. The, I mean, technically, I believe in Connecticut, although I, I can't ever remember this happening um, in an athletics program. I can remember eighth graders when I was principal here who participated in the marching band, but I can never remember an, a student, and I don't even know it's, if it's permissible. I know it is in New York where an eighth grader can play a varsity sport, but you have four seasons, period. So like four years of eligibility. So I, I believe like even in New York, if you initiate that year and forced year in eighth grade, you can only participate through 11th. I, I'm not positive of that uh, in 12th grade, but or in uh, Connecticut. But um, you know, it, the way that we would, you would still have four years of eligibility. Period. End of story. So it would start in ninth grade. We and and certainly nobody who's not a high school student is eligible to participate. You can't maintain C rule and things like. That. I mean, on the other end of things. Uh, I would make an argument that no middle school students should not be competitors in this program. So I could clarify that in the in the in this as well. Thank you. So, Jeff, the the prerequisite is to provide evidence for having um, participated for three years, and then once you accept their application, if you will, they they enter into a probationary period Correct. for clarification. So I guess my question is, what's the process of the application for consideration? Do they submit the paperwork to the AD's office? You know, I just kind of want to get a sense of how they go about asking for that. The logistics. Instead of, yeah. Instead of just coming to the full board with 50 yeah. members to ask. Um, and then I just have a point of edit. Bullet point number three, further detail can be found in the Cheshire High yeah, School. Yeah, I picked up on that. Outlet. Yeah. Thank you. So if we can have like maybe a clearer outline of how one would proceed, you know, if to be considered. Sure. Yeah, the logistic. I mean, uh, we haven't like formulated an application or anything like that. No, but... So, but I, I think we could and yeah. tell people how to submit said application. I mean, I guess my question is in what's the past practice then? I know we had the girls hockey team. They came to the board meeting again. You know, it seems like if you. I think it's storm the board. Yeah. If, if that's the, the way we want to do business. Practice. <laughs> um, but just for kind of, you know, protocols and processes, clear guidelines would be helpful. Yeah. Do we want to have, uh, something, any kind of language in here, uh, regarding your, your sport may be too expensive. Do it, do we want to get into that kind of minutia? Like, Hey, it's going to be, too much of a burden on the athletic program, on the athletic budget. Sure. I, I think that's that's a fair consideration, Mark. And when I indicated that um, present a fully inclusive operating budget, and then if the sport is adopted. Okay. And I, I, I think that is the caveat. I, I could be more declarative there about, like, if it's within the financial constraints of – the board, the school system, because, yeah, I mean, there are some sports that just, I don't know, I'm sure there's some things that just be too astronomically expensive. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. <coughs> um, could, could I request that perhaps for the second reading, uh, we could maybe get a draft application? Sure. Something, I, I know it gets into administrative, but... No, that's fine. I think, you know, until people looked at this and said, yeah, these make sense, it would have been hard to, I mean, it would have been um, potentially a waste of time to create an application. But if you're feeling comfortable with this, 
certainly happy to create an application to illustrate what it would look like. Do we have, I'm sorry, do we have any idea, uh, do you know if Mr. Parasino's spoken with any of the other athletic directors in the SEC about how they handle this? And they've said, oh, that's awesome. Can we have that draft <laughs> when you're done with it? Okay. That was pretty yep. much it. <laughs> yeah. Because okay. I think the, you know, as, as Sam was alluding to, the past practice has been ubiquitous. Like that's what things, that's how it's been done. And it's just not a great way to do things. So, um Trend as usual. Yeah, so along the same lines for this, for the varsity sports that we do have, is there a three three year review of those programs? Do we look at them every so often? I don't know what the time frame would be, um, mm -hmm. and determine if they have dwindled to f fewer than uh, sustainable amounts of students. No, or there's not. Like that. And, and I think there's a couple of reasons for that. One, there's those programs that exist there today all have a significant sustained history. Uh, I, Saturday night, I was at Cheshire. Uh, it actually was Hamden, uh, Astorino Rink, for the 50th anniversary of the hockey program. Um, there's a lot of tradition that exists within the athletic programs that currently exist. And I think we would do whatever we could to try and sustain those, co-oping if need be, um, for a period of time. I can't tell you that would be in perpetuity, but I think, it, it, in my uh, opinion, um, and others certainly, you know, if you told me otherwise, but I think we owe it to those who participated through the history uh, to do what we can to sustain them. Now, there could come a point. Uh, which I haven't seen in my, you know, 10 years uh, plus, I mean, four years as principal, eight years as superintendent at Cheshire High, where a sport is on life support. But nothing is close. And our enrollment, as you know, was at 1,600 when I was principal there. It's a little more than 1,200 now, and we're still in great shape. So I, I don't foresee it changing, but uh, the athletic director has a really good sense of that. The high school principal has a sense of that. The superintendent should. And if that day came, I think it would be incumbent upon them to bring it to the board. We don't have a formal review process, though. Thank you. Um, should we? I'm wondering if we should add something in here about undergoing a, uh, I don't know, a safety review or something like that. Because all I'm thinking about is, um, with this particular program, they've been doing it on their own for a long time. And I'm just wondering, well, if a club comes to us and they've been, you know, ha putting, keeping their equipment together with bubble gum and duct tape, you know, now all of a sudden they're going to go big time. And the, maybe the budget they're giving us is uh, maybe low balled because maybe they think they can get away with a couple of things that they always got away with that maybe they can't get away with anymore. You know, like, should there be some sort of review by the AD's office before they're approved just to make sure that their equipment? Yeah. Because I'm assuming they're going to um, are. So, so, so I guess that even leads into uh, would then this uh, uh, Cheshire Public Schools be required to take on the majority of the financial burden for all their equipment and storage? Or is it still on the um, organization themselves? Two, two great questions yeah, there. Right, the, yeah. the first one, I, I would say it's a, it's a great suggestion about the safety review of equipment. Um, I think we did that in a kind of uh, cursory way that it was probably inadequate. The Hearing you articulate it that way makes a lot of sense. Uh, we'd probably have to take a look at it with respect to fencing. I'm not – I don't know if this epi is of quality or not, you know, I, just not my wheelhouse, and I don't think it's John's either. Uh, we'd probably get a third party person to come in and yeah, say, right. you know, here's where it needs, here was it. And, and we are looking for epi recipients, Adam, if you're not, <laughs> not busy on Saturday. But anyway, the uh, other piece about um, now I lost my train of thought because I was being financial an idiot. Burden. The financial burden is yes, it, it does. We do assume that, and that is part of the overall budget. So what I shared in the first budget presentation, I think it was a week ago tonight or something, that um, that outlined kind of what the, I believe what 
some of the costs were. I'll share it with you uh, so you can kind of see in greater detail uh, what the costs were. Um, but yeah, that's that's part of it. Like we assume certain elements of equipment. So a hockey player is buying their helmet. They're not buying some other piece of equipment. Uh, usually they buy a lot of their equipment, but like uniform things that go over your pants, we're buying that and we're keeping that. And that's part of our athletic handbook stuff that, you know, things that we purchase, we keep. Things that you purchase, you keep. And I know in fencing that um, after having, you know, multiple conversations with Heather Von Fisher, that there are things that are very personalized to a fencer and they would keep those things. There are other things like socks that are specific to Cheshire, although we would probably have them buy their own socks, but like other, there are other parts of the uniform that are, you know, not as personal and they should be Cheshire equipment. So we did work that out and that's part of the budget process. I'll share that with you guys. So you can see what, what we're talking about. Um, so that leads me to my last question is the, um, the, re the requirement of um, certified coaching. Yep. Um, so during their presentation a couple months ago, it, it felt like the, the certified coaches that they had were there mostly on a volunteer basis or paid very little. So if they became a varsity sport, do those coaches then have to become employees or some sort of uh, enter into some sort of employment agreement with the public schools? And then are we required to pay them a certain wage that maybe they didn't have before? Yes. So um, they would need to be certified as a coach, you know, first aid, uh, um, the concussion stuff, basic coaching principles. That's all done through the state. Once they acquire coaching certification, they could be employed by us as a fencing or other coach, if it's a different sport. And um, they are indeed paid by us. When I drafted the budget and reviewed it with Heather, I used a coaching stipend that I thought was kind of parallel to the coaching responsibilities here. And um, we collectively decided that that was appropriate. So. It, it mirrors kind of what's already in our contract. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. and going back to the equipment real quick, um, just based on my experience, there's going to be somebody out there that's going to recertify whatever is being used year after year, and, and the liability is going to be on them, and we're going to pay them, and they're going to give us stuff back. Sure. Yeah. Because we do that, you know, Mark. All the other sports. All yeah. the other sports. Booster Club Association with this, Jeff, that you know of? The, there is a, I, I don't, I, yes, they have a, a booster club okay. right now, and that's how they organize all of their stuff. And I, you know, did talk to Heather about what will that look like mm -hmm. post uh, varsity world, and it would probably look very similar. Um, it may have, they may adjust kind of how they do things given the fact that. Uh, they would be responsible for the $130 uh, participation fee that we have. Um, so I don't know if, you know, they'd ask people to make the same contributions to the booster club, knowing that they're also kicking in 130 right. that offsets the cost of this. Sorry, one last question. I said that last time, I think. Um, what do we consider documented history? Three years, of three years of documented history. What does that mean? So why don't I articulate that in the application process? Okay. But you, you do have to be able to demonstrate that you've had uh, adequate participation to sustain the sport over a three-year period. Give me the rosters that you've had for the last three-plus years. And we'd compare that to, I guess, some other existing varsity sport because i know like i saw on the news that there are other high schools that have varsity fencing in this case sure. you know like, sure. so i guess we would use some sort of benchmark yeah uh, it, for whatever sport it is well we know how many participants it takes to compete and if you've had one more 
participant than it takes to compete for the last three years, then I, I think you're cutting it probably too lean for us to, and I would document that and say, here's why you're not ready for me to put this before the board because if you get COVID and you forfeit three matches, like we can't be doing that forever. You'd need to get to a place where there are adequate reserves to be able to effectively participate. Um, so I, I, I'll try and outline that in the application process. It's, sorry. <laughs> so the mechanism would be that the application be filled out, uh, you and or your office and, and the AD's office would review that application before it came to us for final review is that yeah sort of i think the, the you know in terms of logistics i i could foresee the uh superintendent athletic director and principal reviewing the to be like sign like a sign off or whatever it, it, yeah. it, at the very least you know the three people will meet and move it forward if not a formal sign off process yeah okay thank you You know? I, I think I might be asking out of committee because um, this this discussion is also contingent upon the fact that you put them for consideration in the budget to Jeff. So it's, yep. I, I guess if we can get our second or application process in front of us quickly, it would help to make the other decision, so to speak. Okay. Yeah, I mean, this, uh, given the fact that we don't have a policy right now, um, I don't know that we're constrained by it as it relates to the budget decision, um, unless, you know, that's the, the belief of the board. The, you know, alternatively, I think we know that, um, I can tell you with great confidence that the fencing program meets these criteria and would be approved or else I wouldn't have put it in the budget to begin with. Um, so I, I think it's good that we can kind of move this along um, in the formalized process is, is healthy and it's helpful, but you know, I, I don't know that it's a deal breaker, at least not from where I sit. That's why I put it in the budget. If I didn't feel confident, I wouldn't have. Any other questions? I, I'll just comment that although they may, you may have confidence in them and they may be the first one to uh, benefit from this policy, it's, it's probably also from the way it's written that it's also very possible that this policy will be in force by the time they would be under their first year of probation. Yeah, that be fair. I, I think say. that's fair. Yeah. yeah, agreed. Agreed. All right, moving on. <laughs> Review policies for a second reading. Um, this is is ultra quick. This was a title change for Marlene, um, where we just dropped the four instructional services out of the title, and this is a. Uh, administrative policy that identifies the position as assistant superintendent for indu indu instructional services, excuse me, and we just struck the four instructional services. So she's just assistant superintendent. We're making her pay for the new business cards, by the way, so don't worry about that. Just kidding. <laughs> Garnished her wages. Any other questions about that one? I mean, like I said, this one's pretty straightforward. Okay. Did we move that, Jeff, to a third reading? Um, when we conclude all the second readings, we usually do them in a lump. So, like at the end of all of the policies, we'll do a motion for the first, a motion for the second, a motion for the third to include and then name the policy numbers. This is um, the admission policy, which is subject to change again, uh, you know, from what I'm hearing in terms of the legislature this year. If you recall, this is the kindergarten, kindergarten start age. Boy, I'm having trouble speaking tonight. <coughs> but the kindergarten start age, 
um, for students born between September and January, four years prior to the start of the upcoming school year, are eligible to be considered for kindergarten admission with a written request to the superintendent of schools. I can give you a very quick update on that process. Yesterday, we literally screened a student whose birthday is September 1st. Like that would be the ultimate like cutoff. And um, the student participated, was super helpful in the child, really four year old, uh, participated in the, in the process, uh, provided us and her and her family a lot of great information. information. And I think we're going to be uh, sending out a letter very soon uh, to the folks who are interested. We didn't think it was fair to screen students who are looking for kindergarten admission early on February 4th or something like that. So we're pushing that day out to April uh, to do that. And again, you would still have access to the transitional or the regular K, uh, depending on how the conversation went and what you were looking for for your child. So that's, that's the plan. But this just basically updates the uh, start age for school admission. Uh, at the legislative le level, there's a lot of talk about uh, not having an evaluation process. It's before September 1st or you're not enrolled. Just like it, it was for January 1st. So my question is when uh, these policies are up for a second reading and things are gonna change, do they then stay? where they are do they not proceed to a third reading or no they proceed i mean you could take no action on this at the end of the day no matter what our policy says we have to follow connecticut state law first and so you know is this a priority to make a change knowing that we may very well make a change probably not but it's already in the process if we just play it out we'll just end up doing the same formality after the legislative session, if indeed it does get changed. If it doesn't, then we're fine. So I, I wouldn't recommend not taking action. I'd stay the course because that's the law now and it may not change, so. Sure. I just have an edit, yeah. Okay. There's a period after September, effective July 1st, 2024, and then of yep. any Yeah, I see it. Thank you, Carol. Um, the next policy item is ages of attendance. Um, this again is a revision to the first day of September of any school year and under age 22 years of age, the uh, courts and SDE have determined that you, it used to be to age 21, but they said it's actually to age 22 until you turn 22. The other interesting interpretation is that if you turn 22 on the first day of school, then you stay through the entire school year. Um, which comes at significant expense to school districts, which is part of why our budget has increased uh, significantly uh, on that line. So those are the two adjustments here. Again, stuff that we reviewed in our last meeting, and I think we're in pretty good shape there. New board member orientation. This is um, part of law uh, now that we have to provide an orientation. Uh, I, I haven't seen yet, although CABE is in the process of producing a orientation process for new board members. Um, obviously, I met with Mark and Anne Marie uh, and we went through an orientation program already, uh, but this just kind of Updates, I mean, this policy was from 1996 and it talked about a photocopy of the board's policies and things that were just really dated. So 
it only really reflects that update. And then um, we took out that middle part uh, after deliberation in the last meeting that talks about orientation of board members will begin at the outset of their candidacy and follow through each step of the election process. Prior to elections, beginning as soon as the individual's candidacy is known, the candidates will receive from the board a brief overview of the public school system. Candidates will be placed on a mailing list to receive notices of board and other meetings. Summary reports and board action. Candidates also be informed that additional information pertinent to each board agenda item is available uh, to them through central office. A lot of that, the need for that really dissipated with the internet. Uh, website really has a lot of that. Any questions on that one? So that's that was all we had for second readings. For third readings, organization of instruction. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, board is responsible for public ed. This is one that we we looked into um, and are not required to have, right, Carol? And so we talked about is this really necessary? Um, because, you know, like Humiston School provides special education services. It's not exclusively special ed. What if uh, the board and community elects to um, move to a six through eight middle school as we had deliberated years ago? You know, the, the, this policy is not required by law. Um, there's extensive information about how our, <laughs> Schools are structured on our website. Uh, my suggestion would be that uh, we basically remove this policy from the policy manual, even if it was on my birthday. We adopted it July 3rd. Are you talking about removing it completely, Jeff? Because yeah. it's not required. It's, it's not, not a required policy. We have a million policies that are not required by law. Yeah. And if you talk to some, you know, the preeminent law firms in Connecticut, that's the perfect storm for problems. Um, like Shipman and Goodwin or, or uh, our, our firm Bertram and Moses will tell you, you know, if so we're probably over policied. Any language that says if you do just, I'm actually thinking of Wallingford because they've changed their, yeah. it's so many times. So I would, is there any other language that says if you decide Jesus to do so, Christ. Uh oh. Sorry. I'd rather fight a bear than a mouse. And I just saw a mouse. Oh. Okay. Cover the food. Surprise. <laughs> Jeff's a chicken. <laughs> Threw me right off. Sorry there. about that. You know, if there's any <laughs> language that says, should you make that determination to change the structure, that it be developmentally appropriate to do, so. you know, I mean, just, I don't know. You want an alternative? I mean, we can look at alternatives. You know, we can look at alternative language. I'm sure other, um, <laughs> I'm just going to stand on the stage not from not. I know. <laughs> it's like, and I think I could take it, but it scares the hell out of me, Mark. Anyway. Again, I'd rather fight a bear. Like if a 250-pound wrestler came through the door, I'd rather that than the mouse. But anyway, um, the yeah, I mean, we can look at alternative language. We can table this. I, I, if there's a question, I, I would recommend that we just table it. Yeah. Um, and we can look at, at the next meeting, alternative language for uh, adopting a change in the current structure of the school system or something. I mean, as the language stands now, I think is, you know, if we look at the research, I mean, honestly, sixth grade could be considered middle school, you know, so it's like, whatever you do, I just want to ensure that the decision making for the future is appropriate to the development. But it's developmentally schools. appropriate. Yeah. yeah. That's fair. Yeah. Okay. Any other thoughts, comments on that one? I'm so glad that that moment was on, on video too. That's fantastic. I thought I did something to you with that question. <laughs> Wonderful. I thought you had a short yeah. Oh, you know what, Carol? I need access. Vinny needs access to the civility policy for me to be able to show it up on screen. 
I just sent it to you. Um, so these were for future considerations and uh, just being considered at the time here. Uh, you know, there are really three items that are available and it will be available to the community um, on our website. So uh, there's a few of them here. Uh, the civility policy, equity and diversity policy. There's a couple of different versions of draft forms there. There's a transportation policy, which uh, had been in review, I guess, early in the fall. We were reviewing that. Um, and Vin and our transportation supervisor, Luther Miller, are in the process of reviewing that whole policy to, to make proposed changes. I do want to be clear about one thing that I know last night at planning and zoning, there were a lot of questions about the policy and it seemed like members of the planning and zoning committee were under the impression that the walking distance for students was somehow dictated in bus contracts or something like that. And I want to be clear that that's not the case. Our busing, first of all, if you're in grades one through 12, the walking distance is a mile. If you're under grade one, it's half a mile in grade K. And um, that doesn't mean that we hold fast by those. There are areas where we don't, we believe it's not safe for children to be walking the mile to school um, because it maybe is on Route 10 or something. And so we provide bus transportation there. We proactively do that. If anybody has a concern or question, they submit a request which gets reviewed by Mr. Massiana, Mr. Miller, but really the Cheshire Police Department goes on site, does a review of the site, and gives us feedback on whether or not you know, we should be considering a bus there or something different. And so that process exists. I just want people to know, like the North End, there's concern about Marion. There's no sidewalks there. We've talked about this with the town council. Town council members have said, yeah, we need to explore that. I know they set money aside for sidewalks. They have to explore that process over the next couple of years. But if the school opened tomorrow, we wouldn't be having kids cross Marion to get to North End. I mean, we'd pick them up at the end of the street um, in a bus. So that, that will be reviewed. Uh, the monitoring products and services um, is a bylaw for the board self-evaluation. There's one other one that I'm sure we'll be talking about, uh, and that was the, uh, like the out-of-state travel for PD question came up last year, so we'll talk about that as well. These are some of the pressing items for upcoming meetings, and we just wanted to give the members and the community a heads up about those items, um, as we also need to talk about a schedule uh, for when we'll be, because we didn't have really a regular schedule. so. Um, again, is the is the time really cognizant of the time running down in our, our budget meeting coming up, but um, we'll just have to work together, the four of us, to make sure we can set a, a regular meeting date instead of trying to scramble month over month. Uh, it'll be easier for all of us to do that. And I can, you know, Carol and I can follow up with you guys tomorrow. Uh, Jeff, uh, I think I, I spoke to Vin about this earlier, but um, Mr. Glidden, yeah, I think he's the planner. Yep, Tom Planner. Um, he just requested that um, you could just respond to him about the the busing situation if you haven't already, or if you have been. Great. I did it earlier today. Oh, okay, great. He, and, uh, because I think they just wanted to know the commissioners wanted to know what sure the situation was. That's yeah, great. the email that I sent the board earlier is the same. I sent okay. the same email to Sean and Mike Glidden. Okay. Um, so they, they have that information. Great. Thanks. Sure. Is there any comments? We're good. Yeah. Motion to adjourn. Um, uh, actually, nope. we got more. Let's just make a motion oh, we to gotta, move yep. the uh, status level of sports program uh, 
for a second reading, right? Mike, uh, Mark. First reading, yes, no worries. <laughs> Sorry. So I call for motion on that. Uh, motion to move the sports level sports program to a second reading. For a first, first reading for, for the first board, reading. sorry. So moved. Second. Uh, all all in favor? Right. Unanimous. Uh, motion to move the review policies for second reading forward to a third reading, correct? Is that yes? Is that what we're doing? Or are we? We could say all. All, uh, or you just say policy 2132, oh, okay. policy 5111. We just like to try and identify them by okay. number at least. Motion to move the review policies 2132, 5111, 5112, and 9230 forward for a third reading. That's the, for second a second reading? reading to the board. Second yeah. reading to the board. It's our okay. third reading, but we're it's doing the second, second reading, reading to, we the board. to the board. Yeah. My apologies. That's okay. Motion to move it for a second reading. And then that's all we have for this one. Okay. All in favor, we voted. Yes, we're good. Motion. Motion to adjourn. So moved. We're good. We're good. All in favor, we are adjourned. Thank you.